Ravel's only string quartet is a masterpiece of his mature style. Here I want to talk about the phrase structure in the beginning of the first movement. In particular, the interplay between symmetry, predictability, and subtle changes that play with our expectations in wonderful ways. Measures 1 to 8 consist of two four-bar phrases. In the first, the bass line climbs two octaves up an F major scale, and then the second phrase redescends, landing on a G minor chord. The second phrase starts using the notes of the A flat major scale, and then the D flat is replaced by D natural in measure 7, the bar before the Phrygian cadence, adding a subtle touch of color. The harmony is diatonic, but not really tonal in the classical sense. The chord successions are often modal. Overall, the two phrases form a symmetrical period. They're based on the same material, and the second phrase answers the first. But the symmetry isn't mechanically predictable. The bass going down is no longer just a scale, and the melodic rhythm in the first violin is also varied. The second cadence creates more rhythmic repose than the first one. There are no eighth notes in the second half of the bar. Also note the tied note of the melody into the last bar here, smoothing out the rhythm. Other things to notice here. The modulation occurs right after the peak of the first phrase. It's as though that rising scale on the bass leads us to a little harmonic climax, which then points to music in a new direction. The only times the second violin and viola are at all rhythmically active are in measure 4 in the second violin at the end of the first phrase, and measure 5 in the viola at the start of the second. They intensify the momentum at this critical point. So Ravel has delicately balanced symmetry predictability, while adding, adding little touches of novelty and intensity. This is a potent recipe for musical coherence that still remains intriguing for the listener. The overall symmetry is obvious, but many of the details are changed. Getting the right balance between predictability and novelty like this is an important part of the composer's job. If there's no perceptible pattern, the listener just gives up. If the pattern is too simplistic, the music is boring. The balance of predictability and novelty will vary according to where we are in the form, but the problem is omnipresent. Measures 9 to 12 are structured rather differently. Here, first and second violins take turns with the top line back and forth in every second bar, while the bass arpeggiates the G minor chord. So these four bars subdivide into 2 plus 2. Measures 13 to 16 repeat the dialogue, now forte, but now the violins exchange their parts every bar instead of every two bars. The bass is similarly compressed. This phrase compression creates a sense of acceleration and intensification. In measure 16, there's a mild sense of punctuation when the bass moves from G to C, creating a half cadence in F major. Measure 17, the first violin breaks out of the static repetitions and seems to be starting for the beginning of the piece, but things evolve differently this time. The melody goes higher than ever before, up to A in measure 19. The bass line climbs up that F major scale again, but now it keeps rising all the way up to A in measure 21. There's no real punctuation at the peak. Instead of coming down in an answering phrase, as we did in the opening, now, measure 21 to 23, remain on augmented chord for three bars. The harmonic rhythm has become static as well here, and the whole tone harmony has no strong tendency for any specific resolution, since there are no semitones. So the four-bar phrase from the opening has now become a seven-bar phrase. We're suspended, unsure of what's happening, as the music slows. This seven-bar phrase lets the form breathe here.
What happens next, again, plays with the phrase lengths in interesting ways. In measure 24 to 25, actually only the first half of measure 25, the first violin states an idea related to the opening theme, accompanied by a static pedal bass, and with surging 16th notes in the middle parts. This repeats literally, starting in the middle of measure 25. Then this is followed by a one-bar phrase in measure 27, recalling the beginning even more clearly. The harmonic rhythm also speeds up in this bar. So we've had two one and a half bar segments over static harmony and then a more active one bar segment with two different chords. So following the longer seven bar phrase at the end of the first section, the new section has begun with shorter phrases combined with increased rhythmic momentum. This combination is exciting. It raises the temperature. The succession of two little phrases one and a half bars long is now repeated in measure 28 to 30, but the main line migrates first to the viola in measure 28 and then to the second violin in the second half of measure 30. This creates a kind of textural intensification. The bass is also risen up to E now. The one bar phrase that followed the two one and a half bar phrases now returns as well in measure 31 in the second violin. But the accompaniment is no longer in 16th notes. The following bar brings them back in a rising line. Then these two bars are repeated with varying harmony. In terms of phrase lengths, that last single bar in measure 27 now has become the first bar in a two bar unit in measure 31 32, subsequently repeated higher up in measure 33 34. This overlapping creates a kind of breathlessness. Then, measure 35, 38 are structured as follows. In measure 35, the opening idea is restated, then repeated in the next bar, slightly ornamented for increased intensity. The bass is also risen an octave. Then, in measure 37 to 38, the top line speeds up to include triplets over a rising tremolo accompaniment, creating added excitement. The tempo in measure 38 accelerates as well. This whole section, from measure 24 to 38, is built over a gradually rising bass. But note the variety of harmonic rhythm. First there's the low C in measure 24 to 26, then D and D sharp in measure 27. These four bars are then sequenced, starting on E in measure 28 to 30, then moving through E and E sharp in measure 31. Reach the G sharp and A in measure 33. Finally, after briefly descending again to a low C sharp in measure 35, the bass continues its rise in measure 37 to 38, where it climbs the scale in quarter notes to reach the peak of the section, the high C-sharp in measure 39. This accelerated harmonic rhythm creates increased momentum preparing for the climax. In measure 39, there's an important climax, the largest so far in the piece. Once again, the climax acts as the turning point, introducing something new. Now in measure 39 to 40, the texture changes, and we quickly tumble downward in 16th notes. The register stabilizes in measure 41 to 42, alternating between a half-diminished chord on C-sharp and another on E in the bass. The harmonic rhythm is much slower in these measures. Tension is released but the surface rhythm, all 16th notes, maintains the energy. In the second half of measure 43, the harmony finally moves on to a Neapolitan 7th chord, and in measure 44, we arrive at A in the bass. That novel 7th chord in the second half of measure 43 acts as a formal marker, attracting our attention and suggesting that something new is about to arrive, namely the dominant of D minor, in which key we'll certainly hear a new theme.
texture in Measure 44 reduces now to just the cello. A rising scale in Measure 45 leads to return of the opening idea, stated once in Measure 46 over an A pedal, followed by another rising scale. Then the opening idea repeats twice in Measure 48-49, with completely parallel harmony, reducing harmonic tension even more. This then becomes a pedal point on A in Measure 50. In Measure 50 to 54, the harmony alternates between 5 of D minor and the Neapolitan E flat, intensifying the drive toward the new tonic, D, where in measure 55 the new theme arrives. Balancing symmetry and surprise at the level of whole phrases is a very powerful tool for composers. Lengthening phrases lets the music relax, shortening them creates excitement. This allows what I call breathing in the form. Although there is some more recent music that deliberately avoids all symmetry and predictability, it seems foolish to put such a potent expressive tool completely aside. It's rather like thinking that harmony must always be extremely dissonant instead of taking advantage of the expressive power of varying harmonic tension. Composers need to think about phrase proportions as they compose, defining longer or shorter phrases as the form suggests. <laughs> 